Hey there, and welcome to video number eight of unit seven, Imperialism, Progressivism, and World Wars from 1890 to 1945. Okay, so this is our uh, last video really on the 1920s and 30s, and it deals with interwar foreign policy. So today we are going to be talking about the same time period we've been talking about since topic 7.7, .7, but we are going to be looking at it through the lens of foreign policy. So let's go ahead and get into that. So how did the U.S. try to promote their, their vision of a world order, even while remaining to a certain extent isolationist? So um, the 1920s saw a lot of attempts at disarmament. Now, you may recall even in World War I, Woodrow Wilson's proposed 14 points, proposed disarmament for nations saying, look, the reason why World War I became so deadly is because we all had lots of weapons. So there were some attempts in the 1920s at disarmament. The Washington Conference in 1921 saw a number of treaties signed, the Five Power Treaty, um, in which uh, five countries, you can see them here, agreed to maintain the warship ratio and not produce more than the other countries had. Um, the U.S. and Britain agreed not to fortify their possessions in the Pacific, the Four Power Treaty. U.S., France, Britain, Japan agreed to respect Pacific territory. The Nine Power Treaty, all of the nations at the conference agreed to protect the open door policy, which was sort of um, intended to try to maintain the territorial integrity of China. Um, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, uh, almost all nations that existed in the world at the time signed a 1928 pact renouncing aggressive use of force to achieve national ends. Now, they permitted defensive war, saying if someone attacks you, you can defend against them. But um, the problem with the Kellogg-Briand Pact and the League of Nations in general was it failed to provide actual means of taking action against violations of the agreement. So if people actually violated this agreement, there was no clear... Um, policies on how do we how do we what do we do what do we do if someone actually attacks another country there was no clear policies on what to do and this is also a major major um, flaw in the league of nations as well okay so a little bit about 1920s u.s diplomacy so remember the 1920s we're seeing really um uh, a lot of Republican business friendly presidents, a uh, period, a long period of prosperity in the 1920s. And so these pro business policies are really going to continue to guide U.S. diplomatic actions in the 1920s. And these are going to be kind of a continuation of earlier policies of like dollar diplomacy, for example. So they continued their investment in Latin America, continued to intervene to control land, mineral, and oil resources. Hoover, I will say, agreed to remove troops from Nicaragua and, and interventionist policies. Uh, after World War I, some oil drilling rights were established in the Middle East, uh, mainly because most of the Middle Eastern countries, many of them had fallen under the mandate system, which was under the control of the League of Nations led by Britain and France. Um, and uh, we see, as I mentioned, increased tariffs on imports. Um, and I've talked about this in a previous video as kind of a cause of the Great Depression. Increased tariffs on imports was intended to really protect American domestic production. And this led to retaliatory tariffs that slowed down international trade and decreased demand for American goods. So the U.S. came out of World War I uh, a creditor nation, right? They had loaned $10 billion to France and Britain during the war. Meanwhile, Germany owned owed $30 billion to the allies in reparation payments. So the Dawes plan was established and accepted in 1924. The Dawes plan basically created a cycle of payments from the US bank loans to Germany. And then Germany would use those loans to pay back the allies. Um, and then Britain and France would use that money to pay back the United States, which is sort of crazy. Um, the bank loans did stop after the stock market crash of 1929, and they were just unpaid debts, basically, on all sides at that point. Um, OK, a little bit about 1930s diplomacy, right? Uh, when we are plunging into the Great Depression and have FDR at the helm, FDR establishes what he calls the good neighbor policy for Latin America, which you know was at least a little good. I mean, an attempt at being a good neighbor. He basically said, look, we're not going to militarily intervene anymore in support of dollar diplomacy like we did under Taft or um, under um, under Teddy Roosevelt. Um, I, I think it's worthwhile knowing this was um, not completely altruistic. Remember, we were in the Great Depression. And it is expensive to intervene militarily in places. Um, Pan-American conferences in 1933 and 36 repudiated the Roosevelt Corollary, which suggests the U.S. had the ability to intervene any time that they, uh, in Latin America, any time they felt American business interests were threatened or that just Latin American countries were kind of, quote unquote, going wrong in their governments. 
Um, the Platt Amendment, you remember as the amendment um, which uh, forced Cuba to put a bunch of um, things into their constitution, uh, demands from the United States, including like military bases and um, open trade and the uh, you know allowance for the U.S. to kind of intervene whenever they wanted. That Platt Amendment is going to be nullified in 1934 and replaced. Um, and they also refused, the U.S. refused to intervene in Mexico when Mexico seized the oil properties that belong to the U.S. corporations there. So they just said, look, no, we're not intervening anymore. Uh, the U.S. also, FDR also granted recognition to the USSR in 1933 as a country. In 1934, they passed an act which uh, provided independence for the Philippines by 1946. Uh, he also favored lower tariffs to help foster and boost international trade and grow demand for American products. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the growing threat of fascism in the world. How did the U.S. respond to this growing threat? Um, so again, you probably know some of this if you took world history last year, but economic hardships were not you know, exclusive to the United States. The Great Depression was a global depression, um, and it hit um, places like Italy and Germany especially hard, especially Germany. So these economic hardship gave rise to dictatorships in Italy, Japan, and Germany. Um, Benito Mussolini was the head of Italy's fascist party, and he seized power in 1922. He uh, uh, was all about the glorification of the military and the nation and aggressive shows of force, blind loyalty to the state. The Nazi party arose in 1920s in response to these really terrible, terrible economic conditions. Uh, also resentment over the Treaty of Versailles and all of these heavily punitive actions of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and they gained control of Germany of Germany in uh, 1933 uh, under Adolf Hitler. Uh, nationalists and militarists are going to increase their power at the expense of the civilian government in Japan in the 1920s and 30s. Increasingly, military leaders become more prominent in the Japanese government, uh, replacing civilian leaders. Uh, they persuaded the emperor of the need to invade China and Southeast Asia to get raw materials. Remember, they were an island nation. They are an island nation. Uh, things like oil and tin and iron. Uh, and this ultimately erupts in a full scale invasion of China in 1937. So World War II starts early for the Pacific, earlier than we tend to think of it in 1939 in Europe. OK, so remember, Americans um, were intended to be isolationists. They wanted to ensure that the U.S. would never be drawn into a foreign war again, like we were in World War I. Um, German and Japanese aggression actually strengthened these resolves rather than weakening them. Many saw entrance into World War I as a terrible mistake that cost a lot of American lives and money. Um, the Neutrality Acts, a series of Neutrality Acts are going to be passed in 1935, 36, and 37. This allowed the president to prohibit arms shipments, uh, forbid citizens from traveling on ships of belligerents. It forbid the expansion, or excuse me, the extension of loans and credits to belligerent countries. It forbid the shipment of arms to opposing sides of the civil war that had broken out in Spain. Um, now, FDR was pretty unapologetically pro-British and very alarmed by this. Um, because they saw it as taking sides and breaking, you know, neutrality. The America First Committee formed in 1940 and engaged speakers like Charles Lindbergh to warn against uh, war. So, okay, so, you know, how, how do we end up in war then, right? Uh, so, uh, like Britain and France, the U.S. practiced this policy of appeasement. Uh, the whole point was to try to avoid triggering another world war, even as Italy and Germany and Japan were taking these increasingly aggressive actions in the 1930s. Like in 1935, Mussolini ordered Italian troops to invade Ethiopia um, to claim African territory, something they felt they had been denied after World War I. And they had wanted Ethiopia for a long time. They had been defeated by Ethiopian troops um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. So um, Hitler openly defied all, pretty much all the dictates of the Treaty of Versailles by remilitarizing the Rhineland in 1936. Um, uh, Japan launched a full-scale invasion, like I said, of mainland China in 1937. They even uh, sank a gunboat, a U.S. gunboat in the process. Um, but uh, the U.S accepted Japan's apology on this. Uh, Hitler insisted on the right to take over the Sudetenland in 1938, which was part of Czechoslovakia that was German speaking. Um, and the British and the French agreed to it at the Munich conference in 1938. They said, well, okay, but just no more. And it may not surprise you to learn that within you know months of taking over Sudetenland, uh, Hitler and the Nazis lanced a full scale invasion and took over all of Czechoslovakia. 
So um, FDR is suggesting that Allied powers quarantine aggressors um, by not offering them any economic aid or trading with them. This is overwhelmingly unpopular, and he caused him to drop the idea. Um, he continued to argue for neutrality, but he was also simultaneously building up arms. He convinced Congress to increase the military budget in 1938 by two thirds. And, uh, and ultimately, it was Hitler's invasion of Poland that was sort of the final line in 1939, at least for the Europeans. Britain and France pledged to go to war if it was invaded. It was, they did. And this put them at war with Germany and its Axis allies, Italy and Japan. Uh, Poland, Denmark, Norway, and France fell very rapidly to Germany's blitzkrieg attacks. By June of 1940, Britain stood pretty much isolated against Germany. So how do these policy policies of neutrality begin to fray and shift with the start of World War II? It may not surprise you to learn, they sort of disintegrated. So Roosevelt countered isolationism by gradually beginning to give more aid to the Allies, especially Britain. In 1939, the cash and carry program allowed belligerent nations to buy U.S. arms if that nation paid cash. This really favored the Britain and changed the Neutrality Acts. The Selective Service and Tra uh, Training and Service Act of 1940 registered all men between 21 and 35. This is the first time the United States had ever had a peacetime draft um, in gearing up for the anticipation that eventually we would be in that war. The 1940 Destroyers for Bases deal allowed Britain to receive older U.S. destroyers in exchange for the U.S. right to build military bases in, uh, the, on the British islands in the Caribbean. Um, and FDR broke with tradition. He ran for a third time, first time in U.S. history and the last time. Uh, FDR broke with tradition. He ran for a third time in 1940 because of the critical times, right? The end of a depression, the beginning of World War II. Um, he won by a smaller margin than he did in 32 or 36, but the economic recovery was um, uh, pretty strong based on defense purchases and a fear of war. That really galvanized voters to just stick with their experienced leader. So, after re-election, FDR ended the appearance of youth neutrality and increased material aid to Britain. The March 1941 Lend-Lease Act allowed Britain to obtain arms from the U.S. on credit, not cash. The 1941 Atlantic Charter between FDR and Churchill affirmed the general principles for peace after war, including self-determination for everyone, no territorial expansion, free trade made it really clear where the U.S. was going um, in this war. In July of 1941, FDR extended U.S. support for Britain by sending U.S. Uh, ships to escort British ships uh, carrying the Lend-Lease materials. Uh, U.S. troops were ordered to shoot on sight German ships, basically creating an undeclared naval war against Germany. Okay, so Japanese aggression in China. So um, Japanese blew up a portion of the Japanese railway in Manchuria, in northern Chinese territory. Basically, uh, they did it themselves, but called it sabotage as an excuse to invade Chinese territory. This is in 1933. The League of Nations condemned this, but otherwise took no action, and Japan left the League of Nations. The U.S. didn't recognize the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo that was developed in Manchuria, but no other action was taken against the Japanese, which probably encouraged them to act with further aggression. So Hitler success in Europe after the war began enabled Japanese expansion into European colonial territories in Southeast Asia, the Dutch East Indias, British Burma, French Indochina, which they called the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. FDR prohibited um, increasingly any exports to Japan like steel, scrap iron. When they joined the Axis powers, the invasion of French Indochina, he froze all Japanese credits to the U.S., cut them off from U.S. oil, but they needed that oil. Um, the U.S. insisted they pull out China, which refused, which Japan refused to do. And ultimately, they decided they needed to act quickly to claim territory for oil supplies. So they decided to assault Pearl Harbor. That was December 7th, 1941. The whole hope here was to cripple the U.S. Pacific Fleet and give Japan a chance to really fortify their position before the U.S. joined the war against Germany, which they were seeming increasingly likely to do. Um, Pearl Harbor ended U.S. isolationism and caused them to declare war on Japan. Germany and Italy honored their treaty with Japan to declare war on the U.S. just three days later. Hitler also broke his non-aggression pact with the USSR in June of 1941. And in 1942, FDR, Stalin, and Churchill agreed that the war against fascism in Europe would take precedence over, precedence over the war in the Pacific, which meant that, that, that they would deal with Hitler before they would deal with Japanese aggression in the Pacific. Okay, so that's it for us for the interwar period in foreign policy. We are going to be getting into World War II in the next video. So we'll see you guys then.